Physics, States of Matter. An outline for this video can be downloaded for print from wildgooseco.com following the links to chapter 13. Fluids. Let's look at fluids for just a few minutes. Fluids at rest and at motion. First of all, let's talk about fluids at rest. Remember what fluids are. Typically, we're going to talk about water here. We could deal with the same way with air and why a helium balloon rises or why uh, gold floats uh, on top of mercury. And, um, actually, that's a bad example. How about nickel floats on the surface of mercury? Anyway, Pascal's principle. This is a real important concept. Pressure applied at any point on a confined fluid is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid. Now in my classroom I use a what we call a diving, a Cartesian diver, where I restrict water inside a two liter bottle. I put a floating eyedropper inside and as you pressurize it, it tends to collapse the air inside the eyedropper and it tends to drop. It produces a ratio that can be used to calculate pressure. So the force times the area, which we referred to as pressure earlier, is equal to the new force times the area. Now the area can be in any units, but the force has to be in units of newtons here. We could use the same ratio in other things, but we're going to use it in newtons. So what the application of this would be something like a hydraulic lift. If I apply a certain force down here to an area, the ratio will give me a greater lift in force because I have a greater area. Now you can see the way that they've written it down here. F2 over F1 is equal to A2 over A1. We simply divided the uh, and isolated them into a different way to make a ratio, and we can do it any way we want to on any of the other ones. So we'll see how this works. A hydraulic lift is used to raise heavy equipment that has a weight of 2.7 times 10 to the third newtons. If the small piston has a cross-sectional area of 0 0.007 meters squared and a large piston has an area of 0.21 meters squared, what will need to be the force on the smaller piston? Well, let's just use this up here and isolate it. This is what will be the force on the small piston, so we're going to look for force 2. So F1 F1 A1 over A2 is equal to F2. Well, what's our force 1? Our force 1 is 2.7 times 10 to the third newtons. What is our Area 1, it's 0 0.0070 meters squared, divided by our area 2, 0 0.21 meters squared, is equal to our F2. So let's go ahead and do the calculations on that. Very simple calculation. 2.7 exponent 3 times 0 0.0070 divided by 0.21 it gives us 90. So what we put in as 90 newtons will transmit out to 2700 newtons because of the area. So we put a lot less into it to be able to lift. So it's not unreasonable for us to take a hydraulic jack under the side of our car and lift up the entire car by simply a small amount of pressure up and down on the jack. Okay, well let's take a look at how that works with pressure underwater. See, if we define what pressure is, and we're talking about transmitting pressure in a, mo a moment ago, now let's see what pressure is. Well, it's the force of gravity divided by the area. It can be written in another way. If I look at it from this perspective, its pressure is equal to the density of the, of the substance, the fluid, multiplied by the height, multiplied by gravity. So if, if we look at that and we say, well, let's take a can and let's drill some holes in it. We realize that if the water level is up here, if I drill holes in it, you've probably seen this, where the fluid will flow out further 
on the bottom one? Well, that's because the pressure is greater due to the height. Now, the density of the fluid is the same and gravity is the same. It's just that the height is different as it works down below. So we have a difference in pressure. Well, would that be true then if I put in a floating object inside there? Would I have a greater pressure there than I have there? And the answer is yes. And if I have unbalanced pressures, then I have a lifting force. And we call that the buoyant force. The buoyant force then, as we look at it, the increase of pressure with increasing depth, which I just showed you, produces an upward force called the buoyant force. Now this also takes under consideration a principle known as Archimedes' principle. Now you've all heard the story of Archimedes, how he laid back in his bathtub and realized that as he uh, sat further in his bathtub, the water volume went up and he was able to calculate the mass of the, or the volume of the irregular shaped object. Well, there's more to the story than that, but that'll suffice us for here. So it says that an object immersed in a fluid has an upward force uh, on it that is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Well, this is Archimedes' principle, and it takes advantage of that idea that Archimedes was able to calculate the volume of an irregular shaped object by water displacement. So he's saying, well, wait a minute, we have forces acting on it. And this is a simple concept as we're going to go through this. And it's referred to, look at the mathematics on it. Calculations, buoyant force calculations and definition. Calculated is the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume times the acceleration of gravity. Verbally stated as the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Now I'm going to spend a lot of time dealing with just that half. The weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So as I put an object in water, if I have an object that's displacing water here, inside another container, I've displaced a certain amount of water, and that water has a certain amount of weight. Well, the object that's sitting inside it will weigh the same as the water that's been displaced. Very important. Let's finish our definition. Which is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the object's volume, and the acceleration of gravity. So this is all the way to the fluid. Okay, that's easy to remember. So why does the ship float? Well, when you take a 200,000 ton ship and you put it in water, that big old battleship, in fact, we actually talk about them as not how much the ship weighs, but as the displacement. Well, it has pushed a bunch of water out of the way when it made a hole in the water, and it will suspend the equal weight of the ship related to the amount of water weight. Now you've got to realize that this is not completely in the water. This may be only a small amount of it's in the water, so the weight of the ship pushing down on has an upward force that will support the weight of the ship. Now, let's try a couple of calculations with these things. Archimedes principle, an irregular shaped object is submerged in water and has an apparent weight of 265 newtons. Now you remember I said that uh, um, you've got an upward force and I actually do this in my classroom. You've probably seen this. If I put a, a set of scales on an object and I put it in water, it always weighs less in the water because of the upward force of the water, which is a result of how much water we pushed out of the way. If the mass of the object is 48 kilograms, what is the volume of the object? Well, if it's 48 kilograms, I can calculate its weight out of the water, and then I know the weight of the object in the water, and the difference is the buoyant force. So let's take 48.0 kilograms, multiply that by 9.8, and that equals the, object of the, uh, the weight of the object in the air. So 48 times... 9.8 gives us 470 newtons. That's the weight in air. Well, if the object weighs 265 newtons in water, 470 
minus 265 is equal to the difference of 205 newtons. We're going to call that the buoyant force, like that. So, what is the volume of the object? Well, let's go back and look at our equation, F buoyancy is equal to the density, and we're dealing with water, multiplied by the volume, multiplied by the acceleration of gravity. So if I divide that 205 by the density of water, and the 9.8 meters per second squared, you're going to get the volume of the object. So, 205 divided by 1,000, which happens to be the density of water, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, divided by the acceleration of gravity, 9.8, gives you the volume is equal to 0 0.0210 meters cubed. Now, there's another way to do that. If you just look at it and say, well, it's equal to the mass of the water that was pushed out of the way, or the weight of the water actually, doing the same logic. You created a hole, and you just calculate the weight of the water that was in it, and that's the upward force, and you can use that multiplied by the density to get the volume as well, but I'm not going to do that right here. So, what is the density of the object? Well, let's go back and see what density was. Density is equal to mass divided by volume. We now know the volume, we now know the mass, let's go ahead and do that. The mass is 48.0 kilograms divided by 0 0.0210 meters cubed. So we're going to 48 divided by 0 0.021 equals a density of 2 to, we're going to put this as 90 kilograms per meter cubed, and that's still one sig fig more than I should have, but we're going to run with it anyway. So, does it make sense that it would float, or would it sink? Well, the mass, the density of water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. This has a density of 2290 kilograms per meter cubed, so you'd expect it to sink, but it makes sense why the density or excuse me, why the upward force is about half of what the weight force of the object is anyway. So we're good with that one then. Well, let's take a different approach to the same logic then. A cube measures 42.5, whoops, but I get where you see it. A cube measures 42.5 centimeters on each side and is immersed in water. 77% of the cube remains below water. What is the mass of the water displaced by the cube? Well, the first thing you better recognize is we've got to have the volume so we can calculate the mass, and it better be in uh, meters cubed, not in centimeters cubed. So we're going to take that, and we're going to say that 0.425 meters cubed is equal to the volume. Now we also said that 77% of that was below the water, so we're going to multiply that by 0.77 to get the part that's underwater. So using that, we're going to take 0.425, y to the x3 gives me the cubed value of it, times 0.77 gives me a volume of 0 0.059 meters cubed. So now if I take that and I multiply it by the density of water, one meter cubed is equal to 1,000 kilograms times 1,000. I have 59.1 kilograms the mass of the water that we replaced. Okay, so what's the magnitude of the buoyant force? Wait a minute, buoyant force is equal to the mass, it's equal to the weight, we talked about that earlier, it's equal to the weight of the water that was replaced, so if I have 59.1 
kilograms multiplied by the acceleration of gravity, 9.8. That equals the weight of the water, which is the upward force. So we're going to go ahead and take that times 9.8. This me a buoyant force of 579 newtons. That's the upward force because that's equivalent to the downward weight of the water. You have to be able to see that relationship. So what is the weight of the cube? Well, wait a minute. If the weight of the water I replaced was 579 newtons, isn't it equal to 579 newtons as well? So this is a downward force that's equal to the upward force. That one's a logic problem for you. They better be equal. So what's the mass of the cube? Well, if the weight force of the two is equal, dividing them both by 9.8 gives us the mass of 59.1 kilograms as well. And so those have the same value, just like these. So you better watch what you're looking for there on the difference in the forces. Last thing I want to talk to you here about in fluid motion is what happens when fluids start to move. It's called Bernoulli's Principle. We take advantage of all kinds of, of uh, ideas here with Bernoulli's Principle that as fluids tend to move, they tend to have a lower pressure. For example, as the fluid coming through this pipe is moving, as we speed it up, as the velocity of the fluid increases, the pressure exerted by the fluid decreases, so we have a lower pressure inside this area right here. Well, if we look at a wing, it does a very similar kind of an idea. And you, most of you, as kids, you've taken your hand and tilted it sideways when you're sticking out uh, the window of the car. It hits the bottom side with a higher pressure, producing a lower pressure back inside here. And that produces a concept of lift. But if I, uh, if we're terming it an aircraft, but I want you to look at it from a different perspective here. If I look at the distance that the air travels from here to there, and compare it to the distance that it travels over the top here to there, that distance is a much greater distance. It rarefies the molecules, and if they're further apart, they have a lower density, so therefore we have a pressure that lifts up under here. And they're again known as Bernoulli's Principle. Let's talk about a curveball right now, or tennis. I'm a tennis coach, so I can do this. If we hit a ball so that it rotates with a certain direction, if the ball is moving in that direction and it's rotating in this direction like that, it tends to take the molecules and compress them on top like this. It tends to, and, and you're... Um, I'm sorry, it takes the molecules and rarefies them out because of a greater distance across there than across the bottom. It's a very similar idea. Giving that ball um, a lift up underneath it based on the direction we're moving the same way. So Bernoulli's principle is quite valuable. Uh, if you look at a, a carburetor and an engine, when we choke down uh, the velocity of air moving down, it produces a lower pressure inside the carburetor, which tends to pull the fuel up, dissipating the fuel. So Bernoulli's principle is quite valuable. We use it in uh, aerosol sprayers, uh, like carburetors are an example of that. Uh, we look at it in garden sprayers. If you tend to take a garden sprayer and you've got a container down here, and we take the garden hose and push it on top there. As we push the fluid through a neck down region like this, it will draw, because the atmospheric pressure is greater on the level of the solution here, it will draw the fluid up inside here and we can dissipate it out spraying our garden with it. So there's so many uses for Bernoulli's principle, all as a function of the way the fluids move.